Next month, we're getting a brand new Dungeon Master's Guide, and I got early access, undoubtedly because Wizards knew it took 10 years for me to read the last one and wanted to give me a little head start. I walked through all the major changes in last week's video, but today I want to do a deep dive on what I think is the biggest addition to the new DMG, a brand new game mechanic called Bastions. What is a Bastion, you might ask? Great question. It's a word that means a child of unmarried parents. Now, normally only bard players get... Wait, sorry, wrong one. Ah, oh, Bastion. It's just another word for a fortress. It's described in the DMG as a location that belongs to a player character, a home, a stronghold, and a place of power that the character develops over the course of a campaign. Today, I want to give you an in-depth look at Bastions, how to create one, how to use one in a campaign, and how it changes as you level up. We'll do everything the book has to offer on Bastions, and by the end of this video, Bastion will have stopped sounding like a real word. Actually, I'm kind of already there. Bastion. Bastion. I mentioned in my last video that I'm excited about this feature, mainly because I would love to be able to play D&D like it's The Sims, and by that I mean I want to drown NPCs in the pool and then use their tombstones for spooky decorations. Oh, and build a cool custom home for my character. In every game where I've been a player, we've had a home base, but we've never really spent much in-game time on developing it, because without game mechanics, it feels like wasting time to basically play verbal Minecraft. But even though this concept sounds like fun, I haven't tried out the system yet, and I want to make sure I understand every facet before I introduce it to my own game table next month. Just FYI, this video is not sponsored by Wizards of the Coast, but I did get early access to the PDF for free. Now, before we start building, let's Let's talk about what Bastions are for and why you might want or not want to put them in your game. Here are the basics. In a game with Bastions, any PC who wants one can have one starting at level 5. It's just a building that contains both basic facilities, which are rooms with no real mechanical effect, and special facilities, which offer benefits in-game. Players get to pick which facilities they want, and each one comes with hirelings who run it. Your Bastion expands at levels 9, 13, and 17. You can also pay some gold to increase the size and capability of some of those facilities whenever you want. Every 7 in-game days, unless your DM adjusts the frequency, you get to take what is called a Bastion turn. If you are physically in your Bastion, or you have some other way to communicate with your hirelings, you can send a Bastion order, which just activates one of your special facilities. If you are not home, your Bastion maintains itself, and the DM rolls on the Bastion events table to see if anything, good or bad, happens while you're away. At this point, some of you might be asking, why is this being added? Who is this for? And first of all, it's for me. I just spent six consecutive Stardew Valley days organizing this shed. I am the target audience for this feature, but I think it's worth noting that despite this being new compared to 2014, this is not actually new for D&D overall. A blog called Dungeons and Possums, which was shockingly created in 2018, despite the name sounding like a blog that I would have started on GeoCities in 2003, has an excellent write-up of the history of strongholds in D&D, which date back all the way to the original edition. As the game continued to develop, we got everything from rules for mining and siege warfare to an entire stronghold-focused supplement for AD&D 2nd edition called the Castle Gun. At one point, there were even rules for taxation. Are we having fun yet? All I'm trying to say is that this isn't so much a new feature as a latent feature that is being resurfaced. And while strongholds have served many purposes over the various editions, I think we can guess at two main reasons to use bastions in a fifth edition game. First, to incentivize downtime. I said in my last video that it's taken one of my home games 10 months to get through one week in game, but while the real world pace of the game has about as much urgency as a gelatinous cube on its union mandated 15 minute break, the pace of the game for the characters is very non-stop. Our PCs are under way too much pressure to ever willingly take much downtime. And I know that's not uncommon. If, for whatever reason, a DM wants to make the pace of adventuring slightly less breakneck, once a week bastion turns and the risk of your bastion suffering consequences if you don't return to it regularly could both really help. And second, to give PCs something to spend their money on. It's common at higher levels for player characters to amass way more gold than they could possibly use. So unless you want the peasants to start building guillotines, it's a good idea to give your players something worth spending their money on. There are several ways you can spend on your bastion, either through certain facilities or to cosmetically expand and upgrade it. Of course, bastions have a narrative use as well, and I think that's why so many groups already have similar concepts in their games. But by incorporating them into the mechanics, they can now serve both purposes. And if your players are regularly 
visiting their bastions as a result of the mechanics, that's naturally going to encourage more roleplay in that setting. The new Dungeon Master's Guide does say that DMs get to decide whether or not bastions are available in a campaign. So if you're a DM and they don't interest you at all, then you can totally ignore this chapter. Should be pretty easy. DMs tend to be really experienced at ignoring stuff that's printed in the DMG. It also specifies that not every player needs to have a bastion, so you're not forcing this feature down the throats of players who aren't interested. One last thing before we start building our own, those of you who have been super plugged into D&D news over the last few years may have already learned about bastions from the Unearthed Arcana playtest materials. Personally, while you were reading the UA, I studied the blade, so I looked at the playtest material for the first time last week just to compare it to the final version. And honestly, there are some pretty significant changes between the two. I don't want to spend too much time on this, so I'm going to put the lifelong accusations that I'm a motor mouth to the test and see if I can list all the changes in 30 seconds flat. The concept of Bastion Points has been completely eliminated, which means the central mechanic of using Bastions to earn points to buy magic items is totally gone. It also means you can't spend those points to be resurrected in your Bastion anymore. Some of the individual facilities have received some small changes, like the Arcane Study now lets you craft magic items and the Smithy no longer has a prerequisite. They cut the part where they recommended 6-8 to eight Bastion turns per level, and you can now issue Bastion orders from afar if you have the means to do so, such as the Sending Spell. Bastion events are now rolled with a D100 instead of a D20, making several of the results a little less likely, and they've added an All is Well table, so that when you get a Nothing Happens roll, the DM still has something to say, like the leak in the roof has been fixed. Nailed it. What's up, MTV? Welcome to my bastion. This is my arcane study where the magic happens. <laughs> and by that, I mean this is where I stay up all night translating ancient texts about planar theory and slowly forgetting what it feels like to be touched. Okay, today we are going to be making a bastion for my tiefling crime boss, Augury. You might recognize her from the limited edition Hey Fiend sweatshirt available in my shop now for Halloween. She would be furious at how cute she looks here. When I use Augury as an NPC, she runs a massive smuggling operation. But as a PC, we'll just rewind back to her younger years and treat this kind of like her origin story. Picture Augury at level five. She's young, she's bright eyed. She probably has bangs that aren't working for her. She grew up in the noble court learning white collar crime or whatever the fantasy equivalent is. White rough crime? She's a sorcerer and she's just hit fifth level, which means she probably has about 500 gold to her name and it's time for her to gain a bastion. Now, the DMG suggests that the player might have inherited or been awarded with land, or they might take over and refurbish an existing structure. The actual look and feel of the bastion is completely up to the player. A wizard's tower, a cleric's shrine, a rogue's wretched hive of scum and villainy. This is when my DM would hand me a copy of the bastion tracker. Fun fact, this is the only player facing worksheet in the DMG. Sorry, I don't know why I called that a fun fact. That's just a regular fact. Since she comes from money, I think it makes sense that Augury would inherit property, probably from a distant relative. I like to think it's some old estate that's been abandoned for a few decades, so it's in disrepair, which explains the small amount of livable space that a bastion has at fifth level. Let's say it came with a family name, like... Ashford Manor. That sounds fancy. We start with two basic facilities for free. There's a little chart with the sizes of rooms ranging from cramped to vast. These are defined in five foot squares, which you can arrange in any way you want. For our basic facilities, we can choose between a bedroom, dining room, parlor, courtyard, kitchen, or storage. It's kind of like trying to find an apartment in a popular city. You can have room to sleep, room to store stuff, or room to socialize, pick two. But unlike finding an apartment in Denver, only one of these spaces is cramped. That means it's four squares or 100 square feet. The other one is roomy, which is 16 squares or 400 square feet. These rooms are furnished and decorated with non-magical items, which means you don't have to pay extra for a live, laugh, love sign. What a relief. We're going to pick bedroom and parlor because I think Augury would use a parlor to meet with business contacts. The bedroom will be cramped and the parlor will be roomy because I think she cares more about how visitors perceive her based on her public spaces than she cares about comfort in her private spaces. And if she wants a bigger bedroom later, she can spend 500 gold and 20 days to upgrade from cramped to roomy or pay to add more basic facilities like a kitchen or a second bedroom. Now the DMG says players are encouraged to create floor plans for our bastions using the same mapping techniques that DMs use to create dungeon maps. I would rather use the sims but I'm gonna do my best to go buy the book for this one. We're allowed to have extra features like hallways, stairs, doors, windows, and closets for free. We can also pay extra to build defensive walls which cause you to lose fewer defenders if your bastion is attacked. But it's 250 gold per five foot segment, and I don't see much point in using up Augury's entire life savings to build one 10 foot segment of wall. So we'll hold off on that for now. Okay, time for the exciting part. We also start 
start off with two special facilities. These are the features that actually provide benefits. You can't buy these, you only gain them from leveling, and unlike basic facilities, you can only have one of each unless otherwise stated. So no franchising your pub. But don't worry, if you change your mind later, you can swap out one special facility for another anytime you gain a level. There are 29 different types of special facilities, although only nine of them are available at fifth level. And out of those nine, two have prerequisites. So Augury could have an arcane study, since she can use an arcane focus, but she couldn't have a sanctuary because she can't use a holy symbol or druidic focus. This is basically their way of saying that some facilities are only available to certain classes. I do think it's worth mentioning that Augury has access to all but six of the special facilities, five if she has expertise in something, but a martial character like a fighter or a monk would be locked out of seven to eight of them, whereas a cleric, druid, or paladin would only be locked out of three to four. It's not a huge disparity, but I do think it's a bit unfortunate that only one of these prerequisites is specific to marshals, whereas seven are specific to different types of casters. Mommy and Daddy Wizard can keep telling the kids that they don't have a favorite, but stuff like this makes it pretty obvious. An arcane study is listed as a roomy facility, so 16 squares. I'm going to add it here, across the hall from Augury's bedroom, since she'd probably want easy access to it. It's described as a place of quiet research that contains one or more desks and bookshelves, and it comes with a hireling. Hirelings are the help, your staff, your employees. Every special facility comes with at least one hireling who has the necessary skills for their role. The facility generates enough money to sustain itself, so in this case, the hireling in the arcane study is performing some sort of day-to-day -day labor, like research or scribing or ghostwriting ebooks for thought leaders in tech, and that labor pays for the hireling's salary. But don't panic, Dungeon Masters, because it is not your job to create all of these NPCs. If a player cares about their hirelings, they are free to give them names and personalities of their choice. How fleshed out your hirelings are is completely up to the player. So at some tables, the hireling in a stable might just be the stable master. And at other tables, it'll be Archibald Bucklethwaite, the halfling stable master, a widower supporting his two young daughters. And at another table, it might be Bob the stable master and his cousins, Bob the second and Bob the third working in the smithy in the pub. Personally, I would get excited by the idea of potentially hiring an existing NPC to work at your bastion or maybe doing a little nepotism and giving a job to a family member or friend, but it's worth remembering that several Bastion events affect hirelings. So you shouldn't incorporate important NPCs into Bastions unless you're okay with a random role potentially making them disappear. In this case, I'm gonna use Nimwin, my necromancy-obsessed librarian character, as Augury's hireling here. She certainly has the skill set, and her morality is gray enough to mesh with the smuggling business. Now, this particular facility has two types of benefits. The first is just something you can access when you're in the Bastion, regardless of what Bastion orders you issue. In this case, anytime you long rest in your Bastion, you gain one free use of the spell Identify in the next seven days. You get that benefit even if you don't issue an order to this facility. Sort of like how anytime you're in my house, you gain a cat hair aura. You don't have to do anything, you gain it just by being here. You're welcome. But if you do choose to issue a Bastion order to the Arcane Study, that order is called Craft, and it allows your hireling to make you one of three things. A new Arcane Focus, a blank book, or once you hit ninth level, a common or uncommon magic item. The magic item takes the same amount of money and time as it would if you crafted it yourself, but your hireling crafts it for you while you're doing other things. So you could issue the craft order, pay 200 gold, and then come back in 10 days to pick up your brand new Bag of Holding or Broom of Flying. Now, if the item allows the user to cast spells from it, then you do need to craft it yourself. Your hireling isn't skilled enough for that. Sorry, Nimwin. But they can assist, cutting the work time in half. So if Augury wanted to create a circlet of blasting, she'd be able to do it in five days while using her arcane study, instead of the ten days that it would normally take. I know, that was a lot to take in, but don't worry, the next facility is much simpler. The storehouse is a roomy facility with one hireling, let's say my halfling bard Clover, and its order is Trade. This facility is just a money maker. It has one benefit, which you gain by issuing the trade order. The first time you issue the order, the hireling spends a week procuring non-magical items with a total value of 500 gold or less, which you pay for. And the second time that you issue the order, they spend the week selling them for a 10% upcharge. You can repeat that on a loop to gain a constant small stream of income. 
At higher levels, your maximum value and your profit margins both increase. I assume the hireling pays for their own salary by making videos titled, How I Earn 50,000 Gold a Month in Passive Income with Drop Shipping. I'm adding it right here behind the parlor. So this is Augury's Bastion at level five. She unfortunately does not have access to any long distance communication spells, so she can only issue orders to her Bastion when she is physically there. Let's play out what a Bastion turn would look like when Augury spends a long rest at Ashford Manor. First, she gains that Identify charm from her arcane study, no matter what she does. Now she decides what orders to issue. Since she doesn't really need a new arcane focus or a blank book, and she's not high enough level to create magic items, she'll probably leave her arcane study alone for now. But as an aspiring smuggler boss, her top priority is moving product and making money, so she will definitely issue the trade order. If Augury invests all 500 of her gold pieces with her first trade order, she'll make it all back plus 10%, which is 50 gold, with her second trade order. As long as her cash is liquid enough that she she can temporarily lose 500 gold for a week or two at a time, she makes 50 gold every two weeks by doing nothing. And so can you, if you buy the patented Augury Get Rich Quick online course starting at just $49.99. But Ginny, I hear you saying, what if Augury isn't at her bastion? After all, she's an adventurer. She can't just be hanging out in her parlor all the time thinking, golly, this sure is roomy. When she can't issue orders, the bastion automatically takes the maintain order, which means the DM rolls on the bastion events table to see what happens while the boss is out. This roll is a D100 roll, and anything 50 or below gives us the all is well result with a flavorful little suggestion like, you know who lost their spectacles again. Classic. We all know who lost their spectacles. Lord Voldemort. Anything above 50 will give you a pretty even split between positive and negative random events. Let's say we rolled a 66, that gives us the friendly visitors event. This means somebody stops by and asks to use one of our special facilities. For example, maybe the DM decides that a traveling mage has asked to use Augury's arcane study. This mage pays 1d6 times 100 gold pieces for the privilege. Nice. But if instead we rolled a 54, then our bastion is attacked. At this point, we don't have defensive walls because we couldn't afford to build them, and we don't have defenders because none of our facilities give us those. Ashford Manor is left undefended, so the attack damages one of its facilities determined by a random roll. On our next Bastion turn, we cannot make use of this facility because it's being repaired. If you, like me, have a brain that can only remember movie quotes and the complete lineages of all the great houses of Westeros, this would be a great thing to jot down in the notes section of the damaged facility to remind you not to use it. But it's back up and running for the next Bastion turn after that. All of our Bastion turns are going to look something like that for the next four levels of play. Augury will make a few hundred extra gold than she otherwise would have as a little bonus to her adventuring income. But at this point, the Bastion has a pretty low impact on the game. But then, knock knock, who's there? It's level nine. Level nine who? Sorry. This joke got away from me. Anyway, Augury should probably be sitting on something like 12,000 gold pieces by now, and it's time to add two more special facilities. We now have access to another 10 options. Well, nine, since one has a prerequisite that Augury can't meet. Since she's just gotten Baby's first fifth level spell, it feels like kind of a no-brainer to take the Teleportation Circle facility in tandem with her learning the Teleportation Circle spell. This would allow Augury to travel back to her bastion quickly and easily from anywhere. The order for this facility is Recruit, and it gives you a 50-50 chance of a friendly NPC spellcaster visiting and casting a fourth level or lower wizard spell for you. This obviously has limited usefulness, especially when you're already playing a full caster, but it could be helpful if you needed something like remove curse or speak with dead and don't have a wizard in the party. But realistically, the ability to teleport yourself to your bastion is the real benefit here. For her second new facility, Augury is primarily concerned with protecting her storehouse, which can now hold items worth up to 2,000 gold and earns 20% profit when resold. If her bastion is attacked and her storehouse goes down, she's losing 400 gold every two weeks. That's more than a city guard makes in a year, and only slightly less than she spends when she has dinner for two at a Mithril Star restaurant. What, like she wasn't gonna get the cocktail pairing? To protect her investment, she's going to choose a barrack facility. Each order that she issues here will give her four bastion defenders. This facility can hold up to 12 and can even be enlarged to accommodate up to 25. A single attack on the bastion can kill a maximum of six defenders. So once she's issued three recruit orders and filled up the roster, she can rest pretty easy while she travels, knowing that her storehouse is safe. More great news, her arcane study is now capable of producing common and uncommon magic items. Also, now that she's rolling in cash, she'll probably spend a few thousand gold to add a kitchen and a dining room to the manor. She might consider adding a defensive wall, which will reduce the number of defenders who die if she's attacked, but then she'll realize that it would cost over 16,000 gold and take almost two years to build, and realize that human capital is a lot cheaper. Time passes. 
We live, we laugh, we love, we resolve four more levels worth of Bastion turns, and we find ourselves at level 13. Augury probably has just under 40k in gold pieces, so she's almost certainly renovated both the barrack and her bedroom by now, allowing up to 25 defenders in the former, and it's none of your business how many defenders in the latter. Perf. We have now unlocked six more types of special facilities, and we can choose one more new addition. In this case, the pub. It'll be high-end, lots of mahogany and red velvet, and we will call it the Ashford Arms. Our hireling, Lilix, is the bartender, and also the head of a network of spies for whom the Ashford Arms is their base of operations. It has a magical beverage, always on tap, which Augury and her allies can drink from anytime they visit the Bastion. We will choose a drink from this list called Sterner Stuff. When you drink it, you automatically succeed on saving throws against being frightened for the next 24 hours. Which, to be honest, you can kind of also accomplish with non-magical alcohol if you drink enough of it. When she issues the research command at this facility, her spies start gathering information about important events within a 10 mile radius. They can also locate any creature that she's familiar with in a 50 mile radius so long as they're not hidden by magic. By the way, the storehouse is now earning 50% margins, which means for every two bastion turns, she's making a thousand gold without doing anything. I know we're kind of operating in a vacuum here, but if this were a real game, I would be doing everything in my power to secure a pair of sending stones so that Augury could issue orders to her bastion every single week, no matter where she is. I am suddenly finding it very funny that one of the selling points for bastions is that it gives players somewhere to spend their gold. Meanwhile, I'm out here playing a side game of Capitalism Simulator. Anyway, we keep rolling on the bastion events table anytime Augury is away, and various things happen, like maybe we roll a 57, and one of the hirelings turns out to have a criminal past. We have to pay a bribe or lose the hireling and shut down the facility for a week. This bastion is owned and staffed by criminals, so bribery it is. I know we're playing a fantasy game full of magic and dragons, but I'm very aware that even imagination has its limits. So I'm gonna have to ask you to suspend your disbelief as best you can and try to imagine a world in which a D&D game reaches level 17 without disbanding due to scheduling, interpersonal conflicts, or people having babies. Just try your best. We are on the final step. We get to add one more special facility and we have finally unlocked the last four options. A demiplane, a guild hall, a sanctum, or a war room. Augury is probably sitting on around 130,000 gold pieces and her storehouse is now selling items for 100% profit, effectively doubling the value of every item that passes through Ashford Manor. The wizards that visit her teleportation circle will now cast spells for her up to 8th level. This last one isn't really a decision, because we all know where Augury the Smuggler boss ends up. She's obviously building a sanctum, a place of solace and healing. I'm messing with you, she's definitely starting her own Thieves Guild. We're told that you can distribute facilities over multiple levels, so Augury's building this vast 900 square foot guild hall directly underneath the manor. You can enter via a discreet staircase around the backside of the building, or if you're cool, a secret trap door behind the bar at the Ashford Arms. Now that Augury has her very own Thieves Guild, she can issue the Recruit command to send a team of thieves to steal any non-magical item within 50 miles. Think Ocean's Eleven, but with fantasy characters. Ocean's Elves. Wait, no, Charlie's Asamar. Of course, if I have something more specific in mind, I can work together with the DM to create new assignments that Augury's guild members could reasonably accomplish. If you're looking at this list of 29 special facilities and feeling sad that you only get six of them, keep in mind that in most cases, some of your other party members will also have bastions. And if you want, you can even combine them. I know moving in together is a big step, but nothing strengthens a relationship like splitting the cost of a defensive wall. Combined bastions work exactly the same way, with each player choosing their own facilities and issuing their own orders. The only difference is that you can share defenders, which could actually be a huge benefit, because if one player focuses on facilities that protect the shared bastion, it frees up the others to focus on facilities that provide different rewards that can benefit everyone without having to worry about attacks. Plus, if several bastions are in the same spot, the party will probably go there more often, and everyone will get to issue more orders and reap more rewards. Just one last thing to cover, the fall of a bastion. Other than drawing the ruin card, from the deck of many things, which is obviously a pretty edge case, there's really only one way for your bastion to be destroyed, and that is abandonment. If you issue no orders to your bastion for a number of turns equal to your character level, which might happen if your character dies or is imprisoned for a long time, then the hirelings eventually leave for greener pastures and the empty bastion is looted and trashed. You can also choose to intentionally abandon your bastion, laying off all your hirelings and leaving it to the same fate. But don't worry, because no matter how your bastion falls, you always have the option 
option to create a new one. Okay, MTV, this was fun, but you gotta get out of my crib. I think Ashford Manor ended up pretty badass, but I am not without criticisms here. Several of the facilities seemed pretty useless to me, like the theater, where you have to commit to staying in the Bastion for a minimum of seven consecutive days performing in a theatrical production in order to gain the privilege of rolling a check to see if you gain a single-use D6 to add to one roll and I thought being a real actor was unprofitable. This definitely feels like it would work best in the kind of campaign where players are frequently returning to the same city in between adventures, rather than the kind of campaign where you take an ongoing journey across the map. But I am eager to incorporate it into my own 2024 D&D campaign, which I'm kicking off next week, and just see how or if the use of Bastions changes the way that my players interact with the world, or how inclined they are to take downtime. In the long term, I would love to see wizards or third-party publishers or homebrewers create additional special facilities to choose from, because I think that would really help this mechanic not get boring once you've already played a few games with Bastions. Since some of the facilities are so head and shoulders above the others in terms of sheer usefulness, I suspect it'll end up being one of those things where people really only choose like 10 of these 29 options, and everyone's Bastions end up falling into a handful of accepted, optimized formats, which is super boring and one of my least favorite parts of D&D as a hobby. I know I've been talking for like a full week, so so go ahead and take your Bastion turn. I'll wait. But if you're still here, either because you found this interesting or you're not quite done folding laundry yet, go ahead and hop into the comments down below and let me know if there are any other parts of the new Dungeon Master's Guide or the new Player's Handbook that you'd like me to explore in depth. And of course, if you missed my top level overview of all the biggest changes in the new DMG, you can check that out here. Does Bastion sound like a fake word yet? Bastion. Bastion. Bastion.